Okay, so uh, we're ready um, All right. to advance. Um, it doesn't seem like these are working, but I noticed that this is. Okay. So you just roll the roller. Roll it down. Yep. Yeah, and so that's when you want it to start. Yeah. And you want to go to the next one, just roll it down. Yeah. Let's see if I can while oh, you're still here. Yeah. And that one we don't need. These are so, yeah, that's, these that's are the earlier ones. So you just keep rolling down. Yeah. And actually, yeah. the first one we're gonna do is that. Okay. And I, I'm yeah. probably just gonna do that one sheet. Yeah. And then I'm gonna have them look at their sheets. So yeah, you're good. Well, all right, folks. We are ready to start. Uh oh, what's going on? Is it supposed to do this? All right. All right, this is, uh, now I promised you that we would get to this marvelous phrase of Luther's, sin boldly and sin bravely. But we didn't get started on this the last time, did we? I don't think so. Uh, this is that one that I put together about, it's kind of, it's called, I call it 12 common Lutherans understanding of faith. And I had a secretary that got these swirly little icons and I thought I was so cool being able to do this. And now it's old stuff. But at any rate, number one, now you should have this in order. If you've got the uh, sheet that says a Lutheran understanding of faith, I've got number one, faith is a gift. And this, most Lutherans would say, I knew that. But a lot of Christians don't. A lot of th Christians think faith is something they have to well up inside of them, and when it gets strong enough, God's very happy that they have faith and God will smile on them. But in the New Testament, over and over in various places, we find that uh, scriptural witness says God gives us the faith. He doesn't wait for us to figure it out and get strong in faith. God gives it. Now, how many of you like me and Becky, had children that you provided footy pajamas for. Remember the footy pajamas? We were so cheap, we went to the Goodwill to get them because we knew from all, you know, you get young parents and all these people come over and they're going to give you all this marvelous advice, which they did out of love. And I can't tell you how many grandmothers said, now, when they are born, you buy footy pajamas, Pastor. Don't buy one every year. Get a big one to begin with because they grow. And they'll grow into them and they don't care. They're too small to know whether they're stylish. That happened many times. So we did it. And I got them, especially big, cheap that I was. And Alyssa loved them and Michael loved them. And they you could have them for a while before you had to buy another one. Now, I say that because I think that is a way to think about faith. You don't, <laughs> footy pajamas and faith, they start with F, both of them. And footy pajamas, you know, it, they're given to you and you grow into them just like faith is given to you and you grow into it. But it's not a matter of getting a quantity of faith. Once you've got it, you got it. It's a matter of using it, see? And in time, you grow into a deeper understanding of faith. But it's never that you make up faith. Galatians 5.22, it's one of the nine gifts of the Spirit, faithfulness. And uh, so we don't, and Luther, Luther especially was really keen on not making faith some sort of transaction with God. And that's why he insisted, as Paul did in Galatians, faith is a gift. You just grow up into it. And Jesus said it when the disciples were whining, why can't we have more faith and be like you? Remember this? I'm sure you never heard of that way, but <laughs> that's what they did. They said, where they looked around, they said, look at you, Jesus, you're doing all this stuff. You got so much faith. We got nothing. And Jesus corrected them. He said, don't say that. In fact, he ended by saying this, if you had faith as big as a mustard seed, that's all you need for life, just to use it. Quit whining for more. So, footy pajamas, faith is a gift. Number two, and again, I encourage you to raise your hand if we can have a forum of sorts. 
talking back and forth. Correct me, give me new insights. I love it. I change it around. You people and others have really helped me to understand faith more thoroughly, and you will today too. Faith is a journey. Uh, think about that swindler, Jacob. Uh, he was on a journey, and he grew into a deeper understanding. Then he probably, he did regress as you read that story. And that's just one story. Think about good old Doubting Thomas. I can't forget that, of course. And uh, he was on a journey. Judas was on a journey. Mary Magdalene was on a journey. Your life has been a journey using the footy pajamas faith that God gave you at the very beginning in your baptism, in the hearing of the word, in the Holy Eucharist. Uh, you receive this faith, but you don't talk about it in terms of quantity. It's just there for you to use, and you're not a puppet in God's hand. You can use it, and you can push against it, as Phil and I were talking about earlier this morning, earlier today. And uh, it's all right. God knows and God loves. God loves people who are far from perfect. He loves imperfect people. The only ones God loves are imperfect. <laughs> That's going a little far. But the point is, they had their ups and downs. All the followers of Jesus had their ups and downs. It's a journey. So I say that because that's a word of grace to us. When you start feeling a little like, um, and we use this in, in Daryl Higgins' funeral yesterday, the very last verse from the marvelous writer of First, Second, and Third John, that if your hearts condemn you, remember God is greater than your hearts. So don't sit there in a wine basket. I don't mean this kind of drinking wine, but whining that, you know, I'm not as good as Sally. Don't ever bring that up. You know, God loves you the way you are. It's a journey. You're going to go forward and backward and all your life long. That's okay. Number three, God is not keeping a report card on us. And uh, I love the little icon there. He was getting, he didn't like what he got there, a D in some class. There's no grading for the Christian life. There's no grade. Nobody's an A student in following Christ. Nobody is an F student. You know, it's just you're, you may go back and forth in your understanding of faith, but you are always never graded for the faith, sir. Is it pass fail? Pass fail. <laughs> yes, I love it, but it's always pass. You know, he, God gives us a pass, and that's the scandal of it all. And there's a part of me that doesn't like that. Why shouldn't people have to work a little bit? I read the Bible and theology books. How can she comes in at the last minute, you know, the bottom of the ninth, having done all these mar uh, horrible things, and God says, come on in. It's not a grade. It's a gift. And if you are honest, and this is one of the things about Luther. He was honest to a fault. So he kept finding more and more things he did wrong. And if you're honest, you know that, that we all live both in, in enthusiastically with the faith, and sometimes we set it on the table, and sometimes we're just plain mad at God. There's no report card for it. Uh, number four, God's love knows no limits. Uh, even after the resurrection, when Jesus appeared to them again, did he come? He had every reason to come back and say, you jerks, you all left me at the cross. Mary Magdalene was there. Thank you, Mary. But the rest of you left. Um, he didn't come back and condemn them. He came back and, and said to Thomas, who didn't believe, oh, come and see. Let me reassure you. No condemnation, see? Just like the father in the parable that, he, that Jesus uh, taught that we know so well. The father, when the kid comes back and wants to apologize and, and you know, lie prostrate on the ground and beat himself for his sins, the father says, get up. You're mine. Always have been, always will be. So, um, yeah, it knows it knows no limits. Okay. Number five, salvation is about wholeness. Yeah, this is important because for many Christians, since the Enlightenment uh, and, and before, salvation is about heaven. It's about the next world. And... Think about it. When you read the Gospels, or if you have a red-letter version of the Bible like I had, and still have, and you read what Jesus says, there's very little about heaven. Now, 
It doesn't mean it's not important or it's not true. It's just that the bulk of Jesus' teaching and his encouragement and his gifts to us are about this life. It's not, why are you a Christian? To go to heaven. Uh, wrong answer. You're, that's a, a, heaven's a frosting on a cake. This faith is for this life. To get involved, both joyfully and sometimes to get yourself in trouble. You know, Christians are troublemakers, I said in the sermon. We should be, in the right way. All right. Uh, that's wholeness. Okay. The next one is, now let me see where you are on your stuff. Number six. All right. I just said it. Jesus, Christianity is not believed now, so I can go to heaven later. John 3.16 is uh, often misunderstood. When Jesus talks about eternal life, what he's talking about is the life that is to come is available right now. Fancy word is realized eschatology for John. Is, that's what uh, faith is about, is right now. You get that faith in advance, and you'll be there with all the rest in the end. But don't focus on heaven. It's very, I get a kick out of these books and, and well-meaning people, overly pious, I, in my estimation, talking volumes about what heaven is like. Nobody knows. Lots of luck with all your ideas about heaven. It's a mystery. Let it go. It's, it's going to be great. It's going to be fun. As John Dominic Crossan says, heaven's in good shape. It's the earth that needs the Christian you see, and that's exactly what Jesus was all about. All right. Yes. Okay, is it? Well, I'll see it's. Thank you. Thank you. There we are. But you're following on your sheets as well. That's good. Number seven, though we sin, we are still made in the image of God. Uh, Shelly and I worked together on this, and she did a better job. We are created in the image of God. That doesn't mean we are God. It means we have the image of God in us. And we have other stuff too, see? Um, Luther called this, simul uses epicator. It's simultaneously saint and sinner all the time. From the time we emerge into this world and the time we leave the world and, and we're caught up in that final supper of the Lamb, we are saint and sinner. Now, Calvinism, bless their hearts, uh, tried to, to kind of didn't like that you know there there are some of their and not all of them some of their sanctification is you kind of get rid of sin over in over your lifetime you get better and better and less sinful and luther said nothing doing uh it's all right you're gonna you're gonna be fine in the end saint and sinner and all and the more honest you are the more you realize that's true so rather than get all upset about it just accept it see and that, that's where we're going to get into sin bold. All right. Number eight, God dares to trust us to share in God's work. Ephesians 2.10. And uh, I also wrote in there 2 Corinthians 5.17 to 20. I want you to think about this so, so that we don't get so maudlin about we're sinners all our life. You are. And you're also forgiven sinners. And God respects you and me so much that God, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, has given us a ministry of reconciliation and that we are ambassadors for Christ. God trusts us to do that. Now, God knows we're not going to do it perfectly, but God trusts us. That's a huge sign of affirmation in the middle of who we really are, warts and all. God says, I trust you to be reconcilers with the world of my love. Now, he's the great reconciler, but we're the little ones. And that's why we've got lots of work to do and need to sin boldly. Get to that. Number nine, God is not embarrassed by our bodies. <laughs> I'm smiling because my mother, may she rest in peace, this Haugian conservative Lutheran who never used the word sex. <laughs> but the family bred like rabbits. I got all these cousins that I met a couple weeks ago, some of whom I never met before. All right. Uh, God is not embarrassed about sex or about our bodies. Oh, my. We grew up in a family of five, mom and dad, my older sister, my younger brother. And 
It could have sound like one of these in such a tiny house. Well, it was small, but oh my mother, it was every day. Now, boys, you make sure you got your pants on when you come down. I don't want to see anything. It was always that, and that's okay. But God, it, but the problem is, you start thinking your bodies are bad. You know, when you're a kid, I used to, and I finally got my dad helped me and get over that. I had two great parents, they, and they corrected each other, not in front of each other. My dad would call me downstairs and say, hey, "Your mother, you know, she's right about many things, but not this." <laughs> I was lucky. All right. Now I think that's important in part because in our moral deliberations as Christians, in our ethical concerns, um, you see how lots of people got out of whack with the LGBTQAI plus group because they have this idea that you know anything bodily must be bad. And of course, many of those thought only of bodily stuff when it comes to LGBTQ, like they weren't really anything else but sexual beings. I remember this, see? Well, God loves our bodies. God was not an aesthetic. Jesus loved a little wine. You know, he made a lot one time for a wedding. I thought he was over the top on that. <laughs> Many gallons of wine. He ate food and people got their nose out of joint. The scribes and the Pharisees and they said, look at your leader, the glutton eating with sinners and wine and everything else. Well, that's our Lord. Have fun, Pastor. It's often thought that uh, we're a soul that has a body that kind of carries us around like a fantasy, right? And that our soul is the most important. Evil thinking isn't that we have a body, it's that we are a body. This is who we are, right? And, and God's spirit is in us. Uh, so we should celebrate this is who we are. It's not an act that we part and uh, leave behind. Thank you. And having agreed with you and, and, and liking that, I do have a little problem with guys whose underwear is halfway down their legs in bed. <laughs> I know you've never seen it. What's going on? Okay, I'll stop right there. That's not our business. It's not our business. Yeah, my mother is would, would die if she ever saw that. Okay. That's right. Show it. Have some fun. All right, number 10, God comes to us in the most ordinary ways. This is a huge Lutheran contribution to the church Catholic. Uh, Luther spent a lot of time arguing with some of the right wing of the reformers about how God comes to us, hidden. And we don't have to try to explain it all. God comes to us in a little bit of bread. God's there in Christ. And a little bit of wine, in water, in baptism, in the food that we eat. Um, God comes to us and blesses us in ordinary ways to an ordinary girl, peasant girl, Mary, ordinary. Um, no, God can come in extraordinary ways, but it's not God's general plan to wow everybody all the time. It's, it's in the earth. It's natural. And we just sometimes, and I'm, it took me a while and the Boy Scouts helped me to see this in all of creation. God comes to us in very natural ways. The incarnation is a, a, a demonstration of this. God coming to be with us. Um, don't be ashamed of the creation and the ordinary ways. Yeah, Phil. Uh, there's a lovely quote by Paula de Barcy. She said, God comes to us disguised as our life. Ooh. See, this is why I do these. Uh, what's the name? God comes to us disguised as our life. As our life. Paula the RC. D apostrophe A R C. Yes, that's marvelous. I've not heard that quote. I really like it. And now I'm going to use it all the time ad nauseum, <laughs> which is what I do. All right. Uh, also, uh, Luther was big on the communion of saints, meaning what's happening right here. You are the communion of saints the community coming together, the community of believers. And this is exactly what Pastor Kim and Phil and uh, others have just helped me with. We're adding to each other's understanding and joy in Christianity because the communion of saints is huge. God comes to us in that way. 
And I can't tell you how many times over the years um, my parishioners have said something that I've scratched my head, gone home, uh, laying awake late at night, two in the morning, go, she's absolutely right. The communion of saints. That's an ordinary way in our conversation about faith in God. God comes. All right. Finally, God will use not only your strengths, but your weaknesses. Next slide. Moving on down. There we go. All right. What is this culture? Ever since I've been a kid, our culture, starting in school, not in the church, but in school, winners and losers. Are you a winner or are you a, mm, you know, I hate this little L sign. Are you a loser? And only the winners are important. But Jesus was the collector of all the culture calls losers. Okay? Jesus is a collector of the unwanted and the ones that didn't make it in that particular culture, see? Um, so if you, if you aren't like somebody who's hugely popular, or if you are just honest about your own weaknesses, don't not share Christ's love in word and deed because you've got some weaknesses. Remember, the Holy Spirit takes whatever we do, whatever we do and makes it a blessing for other people. If you've got a weakness, yeah, okay, we all do. And God will use that anytime, any day. So we don't have to uh, pretend that, you know, we can't do anything because we're not winners. All right, and then I have Lord Jesus, the Son of God, trumps all other lords, no matter how compelling or appealing they may be. Actually, I got this piece from Dan Erlander, and he's marvelous. Jesus trumps any government, king, president. Jesus trumps self-reliance rather than trust. Jesus is seeing faith as a trend. Oh, Jesus trumps the idea that faith is a transaction to get to heaven. I mentioned that in one of our commandments, that uh, even Lutherans, a good portion of Lutherans still believe that uh, the purpose of the Ten Commandments is so I can get a good report card and go to heaven. And that's not it. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments are marvelous words from the Old Testament, and they're not a transaction for us. It's all grace. Now, we don't throw them out. That's not what I mean. But it's all grace. Uh, Jesus trumps any doctrines we have, and I might add any theologies we have, and I love both of those. But Jesus trumps them. Our theologies will and must change over time because we learn more about the world, about science, and so forth. And sometimes our theologies need to change with that. But the basic core of faith is trusting in, for Christians, Christ. And let and have some fun with your theology, but Jesus trumps your theology and mine. And I, I like mine a lot, <laughs> but Jesus trumps it. And we'll find out some in time some of our crazy ideas. Jesus trumps any infallible leader or book of any kind, including the Bible. 66 books. Yes. Does Jesus trump Martin Luther? Yes. <laughs> one. By far. <laughs> yeah, I use Luther a lot, don't I? Yes, Pastor. <laughs> Give me one. I don't like saying it either. Okay, that supersedes. Thank you. Yeah, we see enough of that word in the media. Uh, Jesus supersedes my country, my family, my ideologies, and my rights. Oh, there's something anti-American right there. Trump uh, supersedes my rights? Nobody's going to take my rights away. Well, get over it. Uh, faith, Jesus, uh, Jesus supersedes faith that focuses only on the vertical dimension. Now, we need to be honest about this. The church has been both good and not so good about this. Sometimes uh, when you're talking, and I talk about the church broadly, the body of Christ, sometimes when we're talking about uh, faith, it, you get into conversation, and after a couple hours, you realize that person has talked only about their personal relationship with God. But as I was telling the kids and the children, so when you make the sign of the cross, 
There is your vertical line, uh, your relationship to God, but this is your relationship to the world, to every single person. And uh, let's not forget that. All right. Jesus supersedes the military. We heard it today. The West and the East ends of the old Jerusalem, city of old Jerusalem. Um, Jesus on his donkey and cross will supersede the military of Rome and every other military there is. Now, that's not to despair of the military. It's just to say that <clears throat> with all the wars that we've had, they don't really make lasting peace. They make temporary peace. And we are grateful for those who serve, but it's always temporary peace, see? The military is, a, as St. Augustine helped us understand just war theory. I don't think it applies anymore when we're killing hundreds of thousands of kids, massacring what's happening in Gaza and it happened in Israel. And what's happening in Ukraine is another the slaughter of the holy innocents is what it is, you know, and that's the military gone awry uh, and so forth. Uh, Jesus supersedes the false god of materialism. I I've been reading some articles in the Atlantic where uh, these, you know, the polls are polls. You don't know how accurate any of them are, but there is a consistent uh, general percentage in polls about the dissatisfaction of Americans despite all the material things we have because they can't bring ultimately the joy, the abundant life that Christ brings. But it's a hard sell because even I, even I got, uh, went over to get the screen of my 4S iPhone. I know that's really small. Uh, I've had it for years. And while there, I got talked into getting a 15 because, because of all the extra space. My God, you still got that? You know, how do you live with that? I mean, yeah, it's slow. And I'm thinking, it's fast for me. Fix the screen. Okay, well, the reason I got it is because I got a special deal. Anyway, all right. So I fell for it. Uh, materialism is a great temptation, isn't it? You know, we, we can all look at our own lives and see that. Uh, all right. Well, the last one is, I think, a theology that focuses only on God up there and not God down here. And the whole thing about Christianity is a God down here with us. Up here, that's, eh, you know, we'll figure that out later. It's not important. But God in Christ is right here with us, even living inside of us. The Holy Spirit is creating the life of Christ every day inside of us. Okay. Now, we're going to go to your sheets because I ran out of stuff here. Um, what you have next is something about, uh, is it that, uh, is it this thing? With this picture on the front? Yeah. Okay, this is a little study I did for some men's retreats uh, to talk about the difference between what belief meant prior to 1600 and what it means now in our culture. It, it, it's almost an impossibility. It's almost a fruitless word to use about the faith because be prior to 1600, believing always had a person as a direct object, not a statement. Um, but we have come to use believing as our opinion about some statement. Um, I believe the the uh, the Rangers are going to win over the Dolphins. I'm making this up. I have no idea. It means that's my opinion. Okay. Prior to 1600, you didn't talk about those of you talked about people, and that's what belief meant. Pistis in Greek, and what it really means is to be loved someone. Not to agree or disagree with this statement or that statement. What we really should say, and I used to make the confirmants do this ad nauseum during the creed, and some of the parents got angry. That's okay. I beloved God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. I beloved Jesus, born of Mary. Da, 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 da. I beloved the Holy Spirit. You see the difference? It's no longer about data or doctrine or somebody's idea, it's about a person. 
I can say, for example, I beloved my wife. Do I believe her? Sometimes. <laughs> Most of the time, she's not here. Most of the time, I believe her. My opinion agrees with her. But that's not what belief was in the Bible, Hebrew or Greek. It was about wanting to know someone better because you really loved them. You were drawn by them. Um, so it's almost an impossible word to use. The word uh, pistis in Latin is two forms. One is fiducious, fiduciary, and uh, the other one is fidelity. Again, it's not an opinion about something. It's about being faithful, having uh, trust, and also, <clears throat> and also being committed and having allegiance to that person. That's what faith is really ultimately about. Doctrines change as they must. Uh, the theologies change as they must. But the, there's that marvelous verse in the Bible. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Beloved him. Beloved God. Beloved the spirit. And then beloved other people as well. Um, you, you guys get the difference in, in how the word was used and how it's used now. Um, and I think that helps with the creed. Because, by the way, if some of you, as some of my parishioners were, and I understand it, uh, you sort of, um, it, it, the creed has ideas in it that aren't your ideas. All right. Was Mary a virgin or not? You know, this is a big, okay. If believing means believing in the doctrines, the creed says, no, you're believing in, you're beloving Jesus. And they're writing there in the Apostles' Creed, which is the old Roman Creed way back from the second century when things were different. And the idea of Mary as a virgin was more of a theological concept, not a, you know, scientific concept. That would help us to be able to say that creed and be it. Because we're talking about the Holy Trinity, the Blessed Trinity. I beloved the Father, I beloved the Son, I beloved the Spirit. And all the rest of the stuff is dressing. And the dressing may change from time to time. I had one doctor in my, and I loved him dearly, who said, Pastor Aiken, he said, uh, I saw you looking at me when I was up in the choir. You were wondering about my hand back here. I was crossing my fingers about the Virgin Mary. And I said, Doctor, you're important, but you're not that important. The rest of us will say it for you. You know, because it's not about the doctrine. And once he heard that, he he uh, he thanked me for that and had me over for scotch. All right. That's not why I did it. Okay, next one. John 3.16. Have you got it? Now we're going to use what we just learned about the word believe, which is beloved. And uh, it's, it's actually a rather perfunctory one. It looks... It just says John 3.16 at the top. Have you got it? Yeah. All right. Let's look at John 3.16, the most popular New Testament text. Um, the Greek words that are behind the English, we'll see this does not mean what many have made it to mean, namely, believe in Jesus now, get your doctrine straight so you can go to heaven later. Believe is different than that. And it's not about understanding a certain form of atonement theory that you happen to like. All right, let's use, for God so loved the world, the word world there I've underlined, it's not even just the earth, it's the word cosmos, meaning beyond the earth itself, beyond our solar system, uh, whatever God has made, and we don't even know the extent of it, all of that, God so loved what God created. That's what it means. Far beyond Christians, much bigger than that. That, that doesn't always come across in those games where they're holding up this John 3.16. They want you to have a certain uh, formula so that you can go to heaven. That's what it is. You know it. For God so loved the cosmos that he gave. Now, what the, the, the lovers of holding up John 3.16 are making the cross out of the word gave. It's not there. John isn't talking about the cross here. He's talking about the incarnation. That's what the Greek word means. That God so loved the whole creation that he became incarnate. She became incarnate. doesn't matter how you say it. God became incarnate in Jesus. God gave us Jesus. Not just as a model, although 
Jesus is the greatest model, but also as our empower, because God knew we couldn't make it on our own. So that's what the word gave mean, uh, his only son, so that everyone who has the right opinion about him, has the right doctrine about him, or everyone who beloves him, everyone who beloves in him, shall not perish but have, and this eternal life, this Greek word here is, so that everyone who beloves him has what we've all talked about, that final eternal life in heaven that goes on and on and on forever, right now. That life which is shalom, perfect love for the whole world, harmony among, peace with justice, that wonderful eternal life that will eventually go on and on and on forever, you get to have right now. So it's not about the cross here. You know, so you, anyway, if that helps you, because sometimes that this verse is used as a great hammer to make you feel bad that you haven't done enough. You haven't said the right words. You haven't believed the right doctrines. It is a total grace passage. God so loved everybody and everything that God became incarnate and showed us the way to love and gives us that final wonderful life right now. We have it, you know, and we use it sometimes, sometimes we don't. All right, next you should have sin boldly. Do you? Maybe not. It, it's the most bright one. It looks like this. It just says sin boldly. That's it. Okay, and on the back side, it should have Martin Luther's phrase. Is that what you got? By the way, this phrase, or do you have something else? Yeah. This phrase comes out of a letter. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. All right. I'll read it. It's short. What now, Luther? really love this phrase, sin bravely or sin boldly. And at first it sounds wrong, but it's not. It's a great phrase. And initially it happened when Luther was in Augsburg at the, or at the Wartburg Castle. Remember him? Junker George, he was translating the Bible and he was hiding out from the Pope's emissaries. And Philip Melanchthon was back in Wittenberg all by himself who was nowhere near as cantankerous and loud as Luther. And he was an introvert. Luther was an extrovert. And, and Melanchthon, we don't have the letter, but scholars know that he had written to Luther about all the things that were happening in Wittenberg with the right wing of the Reformation, people running into Catholic churches and smashing stained glass windows and smashing baptismal fonts and smashing Eucharistic vessels and statues. Now, Luther got really angry about that. <laughs> you might remember this. And, but Mel Melanchthon was really trying to find a way to find peace. And he said to Luther, this is so difficult because not everything that uh, the Catholic Church was doing was wrong or bad or leading people astray. And it wasn't. And Luther had this conversation with him. And he said, we, we don't know all the answers yet. It was early on in his, right after the Diet of Worms, Worms. It was right after that, and he was still figuring out how to talk about this conundrum with how to reform the Catholic Church, what should be retained and what shouldn't be. And Lutherans, as you know, retain much of the liturgical practices and statuary and icons because they're windows to God. But the right wing of the Reformation got rid of it all. And not only that, they called it evil. And you can't be a Christian and walk in and look at a statue. And Luther said, horse feathers. And he said, no, we don't know all the answers. It's early on. But Philip, let me tell you this, sin boldly. In other words, even though you don't have the perfect answer, don't let that stop you from dealing with the needs, pastoral needs of the people and talking with them about this. And you're going to be wrong sometimes, Philip. And I'm going to be wrong. But don't let that stop you from talking. Sin boldly. Because everything that we do, now some people aren't going to like this, so will you go ahead and raise your hands if you want. 
is tainted with a little bit of that little selfish gene that we've got sometimes. It's a big selfish gene. Your ego, or if I bring this over to Sally's house, these brownies, I'm going to feel really good about it. I know she likes them too, but I'm going to feel really good about it. And Luther said, the more honest you are, the more you realize we're tainted by it. See, it's not all that we are, but it is there. So acknowledge it and look at God's grace even more faithfully and fervently. So here's what he says to Philip. Be a sinner and sin boldly, but let your trust in Christ be stronger still. And rejoice in Christ, who is the victor over sin, death, and the world. Now, the next one you have should be a picture of a woman. Yes, Pastor. Can, can, can that be understood in this way that when we know um, this is not what life should be, um, that's what I'm going to do. I can sin. Or is it uh, doing what you understand to be you know, the right thing, even though everybody else thinks it's wrong? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a little bit of both of that. Uh, now, and I'm I'm shooting from the hip here, but go ahead. I, to me, it always sounded like a call to action. In other words, you know, sin boldly. Go do what you think needs to be done. I mean, you're not always going to be 100% right. Rarely will you be 100% right, but it's better to do something than to be passive. I'm good. Can I record you for future use? That's exactly the answer, then better than mine. Okay. And as an example of that, you've got this curler on your next. This is called curling. You don't know anything about it because it's warm out here. But in Canada and Fort Francis, I was on the men's church curling team, believe it or not. I'd never heard of curling. I thought it had something to do with your hair. And they said, Pastor, no. You're living in Iceland here. There's ice everywhere. And we curl, meaning we throw rocks and twist them and turn them and have a nice game. And afterwards, we go up and have a drink. You're going to love it. And I did. And I was the worst curler on the team. And everybody knew it. And they would joke with me and give me a hard time. And, and it was fun. All right. They, actually, the women are far better curlers than the men. And the men are take it really... They, they're very competitive, but at the end, curling is a, is a nice sport. It's the only sport I've really ever done and can do, sort of. All right. Now, what you see is a woman smiling. Look at that. And she's got a broom in her left hand. You have a broom. And you have a heavy rock. It's a 22-pound rock. And it's shaped that way, and it's got a handle. And you, you throw it out of the hack like this. There's a hack. I got a picture of it on the next page. You put your shoe in there, you get this 20 pound rock. And if you're nice and limber, by the way, old men were doing this all the time. They were going, <laughs> they had this high voice because they were so excited. You got to sweep in front of your, your partner's rock because what happens is for a moment, the ice in front that you're sweeping melts and it makes that rock look slippery. And then someone will just, it's just, it's so much energy. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and then you try to get your rock into the gold, gold down here. There's, there's colors, blue, yellow, orange. I'm making that up. And uh, the game is won by those who get the most points. Okay, now we're going to go back to symbol. Turn the next page and see the hack. See where her foot is? And it's in a little yellow acrylic uh, slot because it's slippery. So you want to start out real strong with that 20 pound rock and you go from the hack and you, you throw your rock and other people sweep like crazy if it's not going fast enough or they get off of it if it's going too fast. Most of mine went too fast and hit the other end. I was worthless. Uh, and they said, Pastor, don't worry. There's four of us. We'll make up for your errors. <laughs> Now, I tell you that because let's go back to that woman. Let's say she was like me, knowing she was the worst on the team. And she liked curling, but she wasn't perfect at it. She could say, I'm just a, 
I'm just a pain on this team. I'm not good. I'm not even, I'm going to quit curling. Now, I heard this conversation several times and people who curl love to curl and they love to be encouragers. I found this to be the case. And they would say, Jenny, don't worry about it. We're not in, this is, there's no money on this game. We're not in this for blood. You're part of the team. We love you. Stick out, just stick with it. See, but you never get out of the hack if you think that your sins, your little selfish gene is not good enough for God. And that's why Luther says, would say to this curler, sin boldly, get in the hack and throw that rock. Nora. Oh, wow. Participation supersedes winning. Say it again. Participation supersedes victory. You're going to write my next one. Uh, participate. That's all. Jesus is always saying two words to, to the, his disciples. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. You will do things that I that are greater than me, he said in one scandalous passage in the <laughs> Gospels. Um, follow me. Do it. Don't be afraid. See? Well, we don't have enough faith. Just get out and do it. Get out of the hack in curling, throw that rock. you got other team members. But by the way, this is an important message I want to give to you, marvelous people. You have a team here, to use a, you know, a secular phrase. It's a team called the body of Christ. What you lack, your neighbor has in some fashion, and vice versa. And that's why Luther said, sin boldly, you belong to the body of Christ. There'll be other people to clean up a mess, to inform you, to encourage you. Sin boldly, you know you're going to screw up, but you've got to get out there. God has given you work to do in the world, the ministry of reconciliation, to be an ambassador for Christ. Don't stand there in the hack and not do anything because you're afraid that your sins are going to overcome grace. They'll never, ever overcome grace. You can't do anything that will get God to stop loving you. That's the marvelous scandal. That's the best parent in the world times a million. You know, because most parents slip up once in a while and they make it a little transactional. You know, if you were to do this better, Jimmy, not God. God says, hey, you, show me what you can do. You screw up, I've got your back. Okay, does that make sin boldly a little more palatable than... Yes. And I think I would, uh, I understand what you're saying, but I would also like the phrase live boldly. Ooh. They should be side by side. And, and just think about our culture right now. And I'm not going to get into politics, but you know what I'm talking about. Live boldly right now it means go down to your legislator, uh, the sessions, talk about things. I know the first time I did that, I was a young pastor and I was scared. Um, after you do it a few times, you gain a little energy. You gain you know, some courage. It's not about being perfect. It's about participating. It's about living boldly and pick up the criticism. That's okay. What's better than the criticism is the unmerited grace of God. Always. You live in that bubble. So do it. And that's what Luther was saying. Because God is so gracious, I love this phrase, I know what I will do. And I'll get to it after I do the fireman. Laura. I watched the movie last night called Fire is Rod. And it's a wonderful movie about grace. Don't go too fast. I don't mm -hmm. I watched it too. Is it the most grace-filled movie? Yes. It's a musty movie. Uh, is it on Netflix? Yes, that's why I saw it. It's it's like the number four or five movie this week. See, this is the this is the communion of saints happening here. Bring it. I do agree. It's not a grace. I find I still find it. It's 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 based on a on a real person. And yeah, it's quite a story. Thank you. That's what we need to do for each other. Lift up little examples like this. And we encourage and strengthen the body of Christ by talking this way. All right. Now, this, I was telling Phil earlier, this is not a picture I took. Are we at the fireman now? 
All right, this is not a picture I took, but when I was a year after my confirmation, so I, I was confirmed in ninth grade, in 10th grade, uh, on the way down to see my dad downtown Minneapolis, he worked at the courthouse, on Lake Street and Pillsbury, just uh, north of there, was an apartment building that was burning to the ground. It did burn to the ground, but when I saw it from the bus, I saw the firemen carrying down a human being on a ladder who was motionless. Lots of billowing smoke, lots of police cars. The bus had to stop a long time. And so I watched this whole thing. This fireman, God bless the firemen in this world, carrying down this life that looked lifeless, person down the ladder, way high. It was like a 17-story apartment complex. Brought... I didn't know it was a man or a woman at first. It turns out it was a man. Brought him down to the ground. Uh, he wasn't fully clothed. And he started to do CPR and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation a long time. This guy could have died easily, but he was brought back to life. And now the windows were down. This is in the old days and everything. We could hear the crowd talking about it and they said he's coming around he's coming around he's come he's alive and there was cheers and there was clapping and this guy got up and said you saved my life and the fireman did and did here's the question for you did the man have anything to do with that salvation i mean did the man assist to be saved not at all. He was unconscious. He was limp. He didn't do a thing. And yet this rescuer, as a, a type of Christ, came down and not only found him, yes, now think about Christ, found him, lovingly gathered him up in his arms like the parable about the shepherd, brought him down the ladder in terrible conditions. They both could have died. And then when he saw he was lifeless, he breathed life into him. And the man said, and I, we got this later because it was on the news. He said he was going to pay the fireman because <laughs> that's our system. You know? And the fireman said, oh, no, you don't pay for this. This is my job and I like it. And he did absolutely nothing to be saved. And the, the essence of it was, uh, as I recall in the news, they, the fireman said, oh, you're happy about it? Pay it forward. This is the life of the Christian. And this is why Luther said sin boldly, because the grace is there. And Luther ended up saying in his uh, Freedom of a Christian uh, pamphlet, um, since God has given me all things for life and salvation, and all grace and all righteousness, he didn't talk about him bringing righteousness, but God bringing righteousness. There is nothing I can do. Or as Gerhard Ferdy said, and you had Gerhard Ferdy at seminary. I, I love the way he said it in class. He was talking about soteriology and Jesus. And he said, well, what do you do when there's nothing to do? He said it like that. Similar. And he said, <laughs> he, he was brilliant, theologian, seminary professor. He said, in a sense, in effect, you pay it forward. You're so happy. And Luther was. And so Luther said, he didn't know 30, but Luther said, I know what I'll do. I will do nothing in this life. And this is a quote, except what is good, right, and salutary for my neighbor. For from love comes joy and service to my neighbor. Luther was huge on the horizontal aspect. Remember I was doing the cross, our vertical relationship and our relationship to the world. He had the community chest in Wittenberg. He made sure the poor and the homeless were taken care of because of the unconditional, marvelous, over-the-top love and unconditional grace of God. And that's where sin boldly came into his language. And then after he talked about with Philip Melanchthon, he talked about it many times in his commentaries. Go out. You have been saved. You didn't do anything for it. 
but you're happy to be alive. Go sin boldly now. Know that you, some of the stuff you're going to do isn't going to be perfect. Go do it. You're going to rely on grace. And again, just so we make it clear, it's not a permission to do bad things. You know, it sounds like that. That's not what it is. It's deeper than that. It's just knowing that we have this condition and we have the opposite. We have both. We're, a com we're complex made in the image of God. But this part is where he's saying sin boldly. So what did I have on the other page? Yeah, what are you doing? There's nothing to do. Next page. Reconciliation. And there's that verse I spell all the time. I'm always talking about it. God has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ. It's longer than that. But I, you know, I'm trying to make this so that it would appear large and not all these words. Uh, it starts out, that passage starts out this way from St. Paul. If anyone is in Christ, there is a what? New creation. Behold, the past is gone. All things have become new. You can be a fool for Christ, he says later on in Galatians. You can be a fool for Christ doing things that you get no payment for and no accolades for, but you do it because you're so happy in Christ. And that's what I talked about with Daryl at the funeral yesterday, too. Um, no, we, we do our ministries knowing they're never going to be perfect. But we are ambassadors for Christ, and we have the ministry of reconciliation. And God knows this world needs it. They need us to speak and us to act. Okay, do you have uh, Alexa Manus on the next one? Do you have the picture of the Christ on the cross with the head of an ass? I've already talked about this, so I won't go into it again. But I thought because today was donkey day, <laughs> that you would, some of you wanted it and I didn't have enough copies. This is found in 1857 by an archaeologist on Palatine Hill in Rome. And it, it shows uh, a man, his name is Alexa Manus, and he's worshiping his God. In other words, he's worshiping Jesus. No, we don't know if he really did, was a silent admirer of Jesus and did worship Jesus and his fellow soldiers were making fun of him. Or if he was, uh, you know, when you're when your downtime as a military soldier in Rome and not enough people to kill, um, <laughs> then then you talk about this and you you do little playlets. And John Dominic Crossan, who emphasizes this, he came out when I, I called him to do some work with our pastors. He said, my guess is that he was play, he was doing a play. He was showing how stupid the Christians are. They worship an ass because he comes running in to uh, Jerusalem on a donkey. He picks up the unwanted. He's the collector of all people. That's not, see. So I just give you that one for free. Then on the back side, it talks about the Bible. It's misuse. I think you have that one. If there's a common thread winding its way through the skepticism of church and God and faith, I find it's this. Our own misuse of scripture and theology pushes people away from us. And I'm Pastor Kim, all, many of you have had people come to you from various faith traditions and say, I'm done. I can't take it anymore. God has to be at least as loving as me for me to worship God or go to church. And all I'm hearing in these this pastor's sermons and the pious people around him is, is uh, well, God really loves you, but you know, you don't uh, make the mark. It's hellfire. And people are studying more than they ever have. And this is a good thing. And they're questioning more. And uh, I like what Jack Nelson Palmeyer used to say. When you hear stuff like this, you, your first thought should be, I doubt it. If God is the loving God that we see in Christ, then I would doubt that he's preparing a hell for people who aren't uh, perfect in the end. Um, but, but this is a huge problem in our culture. That we've become a secular culture like Europe. And uh, some of that was, as people will point out, I'm not so sure how Christian they were beforehand. If it was just to say the right words to go to heaven, that piety isn't cut anymore. There's got to be integrity to our faith. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect. But uh, I've dealt with so many people, and I've walked with them. It's difficult. Very often, the tears flow 
I've lived a whole life like this pastor. I've wasted it because I've judged every person on the basis of these doctrines that we've been hearing. Um, it's sad. Um, we, we need to be good mouthpieces, but we still need to remember that when we do that, we are sinning boldly. We are not going to be perfect. And that's why it means it's more than a, a, a banner, John 3, 16 at a ball game. You need to talk with people, look at them, maybe hug them, talk to them, look at their eyes. It's relational. Everything about God is relational in our Christian faith. It's not lambasting people with doctrines. Okay, what else have you got? Oh, faith is a gift. Yeah, I just threw that in there because I had a page that wasn't full and I thought <laughs> in my idiocy, well, I'll make it full. No, that's using more ink, you know, but anyway. <laughs> All right, it is uh, been an hour. Any other comments? When anyone want to do a collect and pull together some of these thoughts or... Or say, wait a minute, Aiken, you got something wrong there. So I do, probably. I like the concept of sinning boldly because I'll tell you what, it's really helped me get out of the hack. You know what I mean? It's helped me throw my rock. Because, and especially if you've got forgiving people on your team, which all of you are, you've got forgiving people on your team, you know you can go out there and make a fool of yourself, even say the wrong thing, even adopt some of that terrible theology from time to time and doctrine because it's maybe in you and then you realize i made a mistake but i'm not gonna stop trying i'm not gonna stop participating and living the life of christ as best as i can or as luther said remember you're not christ you're little christ so <laughs> use that and that'll help you another way he was saying sin boldly you are a little christ you aren't christ the world, you're not holding the world up by yourself. On the other hand, you have been given a charge, a task, a ministry to <laughs> work with Christ in the reconciliation of the whole world. Okay. It, it's a nice day out. We got to go home. And... Thank you. You're welcome. No, I'll let you do this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Site that's supported by Luther Seminary. But what's and, it called? And then Faith Lead. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I think it was actually a couple of years ago, but he was talking about we have left the agents association. And are moving into the big major audience. And he's saying, you know, when you and I were young kids, somebody said, Oh, tell me about yourself. I will say on this day, my God is this, and the my kids' the baseball, baseball team, team, and I belong. Yeah. We, who we were, was when we were a So, and the 